switch gears a little bit now and, and talk about the vertex you're going to talk about our vertex now this is a 76,000 BTU unit correct yeah that, that's right um, b before we get into kind of the the meat and potatoes on the heater let's talk a little bit about some of the features and benefits okay. you know why would somebody want to put in uh, the vertex in their home compared to any other heater uh, we, we got a little slide for you here that kind of outlines some of this if we can uh, can pull this slide up so the first thing we're going to talk about is, you know, we can use PVC pipe with this, and we can use two inch, three inch, or four inch, which is that's pretty, um, uh, you know, got a lot of different options. There. Yeah, it, it, the, the <laughs> vertex is very versatile. Again, uh, the the fern coat that comes with the the heater right off the top of the blower is going to be a two inch, mm -hmm. but you don't have to maintain two inch. Uh, as a matter of fact, you don't want to main two, maintain two inch depending on your vent run. Okay. Um, if you're running two inch pipe, you can go up to 25 equivalent feet. And by equivalent feet, it means we have to calculate our 90s and, and those type of things. Five foot for every right. 90. Uh, two, 25 feet on two inch, uh, 65 feet on three inch, and up to 128 feet on four inch. So you're able to, to, to go really any option. I mean, you can put this water heater pretty much anywhere. Yeah, at 128 feet on four inch pipe, uh, you're not going to run into too, too many scenarios where you couldn't put this right, yeah. uh, in any application. And again, it uses standard uh, inexpensive PVC yes. venting, uh, so installation uh, costs are, are pretty low. Yeah, uh, and this is you know pretty much it's a it's a power vented water heater, so we've got a we've got a blower on this thing, um, and we're going to kind of talk about that in a minute. Um, but you know we've got side connects on this, we've got an inlet and outlet on the side, mm -hmm. and that 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 works for uh, you know recirculating uh, hot water. We can we can use a uh, recirc systems on Yeah, this. the Vertex comes factory installed with side loops. Mm -hmm. uh, now what that's there for, if you're using the water heater uh, to, to operate any type of hydronic heating, okay. uh, say floor heat or, or, or something like that, the water heater is already manufactured with those side loops in there uh, so that you can use the, the hot water inside the tank for your hydronic purposes as well. The only thing that you need to remember is this is not an enclosed loop. It's not a separate loop inside the heater. Uh, you will be using potable water in your hydronic system, so make sure you don't use any type of glycol or anything, any type of solution. Right. Uh, because again, you will be introducing that into your potable system. Yeah, that's a, that's a big yeah. It's potable water. Correct. <laughs> All right. So and you know the inside is actually we're using commercial grade glass lining on this mm -hmm. as well. Um, and that's a, that's a big thing. This just like the um, the MXI, um, you know, how we're using that is is that's commercial grade glass as well. That's superior protection. It really is. And what we mean by commercial grade uh, glass lining process is means that all of the welding. Uh, to the steel is done after the glass lining process. Basically, we build the entire tank, dunk it in the slip solution, and then run it through the furnace uh, after, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, bef after all of the welding is done. Right, after the this welding. This way we're not doing any seam welding after the glass lining process. Again, it's just added protection. Yeah, and, and we have a heat exchanger in there that's a helical heat exchanger, which we'll talk about in a moment. It's glass lined on the inside and outside as well, just like the MXI. It is, it is. All right. Uh, because the water heater is condensing technology, we know that we're going to get uh, some right acidic there. condensation inside the, the, the heat exchanger. Mm -hmm. um, so to prevent any type of corrosion or anything and for product longevity, we do glass line both the inside and the exterior of that heat exchanger. Yeah, that, that's very good uh, because it does produce condensation. That's right. All right and, and another added benefit for this, we have um, two anode rods in this. That's for superior protection mm -hmm. as well. Most residential water heaters have only one. Yeah, most, most residential water heaters have one anode rod and it can be either aluminum or magnesium, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the unit that you purpose. The, the Vertex has dual magnesium. Okay. okay, so you've got two anode rods factory installed in the water heater, and they're both magnesium. Again, longer protection uh, and less maintenance as well. All right, and we were talking about that internal heat, he, helical heat exchanger. Uh, you can go ahead, Heather, and pull that shot up one more time. Um, this is how we're transferring the heat into the water. I mean, it looks like a big spring. Yeah, as you can as you can see from the, that image there, most water heaters have a flow tube that, that run the entire length of the water heater and they exit through the top. Mm -hmm. We can see here that what happens is we have a two inch flue tube that travels uh, a little better than halfway up the heater. Mm -hmm. Then we make a turn and we helical that, that flue tube back down to the bottom of the water heater. 
what this does is increase the surface area yep. of the flu tube uh, as it comes in contact with the water inside the tank. We can squeeze every bit of BTU we can out of the combustion product and transfer it to the heat. That's what gives us that 90% thermal efficiency on the product. Yeah, because we have more surface area. Those flue gases are in there longer. They can transfer it, you know, in the water longer, it's going to transfer it into that yeah, 50 gallon tank. That's exactly right. If you're familiar with commercial products mm -hmm. like a multi flue, right. uh, we get more heat transfer because we have more flues inside the product. Right. It's kind of the same principle. Now we just have one flue, mm -hmm. it's just really long. Um, and, and we, we helical back down the bottom of the water heater uh, and extend that surface area where we can put more heat into the water. Not only is it 90% thermal efficient, which is great, mm -hmm. uh, we're able to give 92 gallons per hour recovery, which that's, is huge. That's right, that's a big number. Uh, we're talking about a 50 gallon water heater. Mm -hmm. uh, a 50 gallon water heater that produces 92 gallons uh, per hour of recovery. That is a big number. That helical heat exchanger technology is what allows us to do that. If you guys are familiar with the Cyclone product, mm -hmm. uh, the, the same technology that, that's built inside the Cyclone is built into this Vertex. That's how we can achieve these type of numbers. And, and we're able to recover so much. Uh, and in certain situations, we can have continuous hot water. I mean, if we're using only a few gallons a minute. Yeah, the, the 92 gallons per hour recovery is, is based on a 90 degree heat rise right. or a 90 degree delta T. And what we're talking about, the difference between the incoming cold water mm -hmm. and the outlet temperature of the water heater. That The differential there is known as our delta T. Mm -hmm. uh, at, a, at a 90 degree delta T, we can give you 92 gallons per hour. Um, in an area where the water groundwater temperature is not as cold, uh, this water heater can produce up to three gallons per minute of continuous hot water. Uh, at a 45 degree heat wow. rise or a 45 degree delta T, this water heater will provide an endless shower. Uh, that's, that's unbelievable. Yeah, that, that, that is pretty impressive for a residential water heater. Yeah, and that's some of the features and benefits on this water heater. Uh, what we want to touch on now is we're going to talk a little bit about troubleshooting um, and, you know, some of the things that you could expect. Again, we're talking about the 80% here. Uh, mm -hmm. This is what you might see out in the field 80% of the time um, or, the, you know, based on the calls that we get. We know what's out there. Uh, so let, let's talk about, and it really breaks down into three codes, right? Yeah, it does. Uh, the, the Vertex product uses the White Rogers IntelliVent control valve. Uh, and that's what we have here. Now, this valve has the potential of throwing 16 different error codes, mm -hmm. depending on what's going on with the water heater. Uh, but we normally see three. Okay. Uh, there, there's a few of these that you never see. There's a couple that you see periodically. Uh, but for the most part, these three codes are what you're going to see. And the first one is an error code four. Right. Uh, and the way that we know what error code we're in, if we look at the front of the control valve, we see that there's a series of lights. Uh, and depending on the order in which lights are lit up will tell us what error code that we're in. Now on an error code four, what we're gonna see is this green vacation light, the yellow triangle light, and the yellow C light. That will indicate that we are in an error code four. What is an error code four? Basically what we're dealing with here is a pressure switch. Okay. Um, the pressure switch is there to make sure that the water heater is operating in a, in a safe environment, mm -hmm. meaning uh, it's getting plenty of intake air and it's able to exhaust the combustion product freely. Mm -hmm. If anything impedes either one of those, then that pressure switch is there to open up and shut the unit down. Mm -hmm. That's what it's telling us. It's, it's telling us that that pressure switch remained closed uh, I'm sorry, remained open, open during a call for heat. It is a normally open switch. Once the blower engaged, that vacuum closes the pressure switch, and that's how the heater knows that A, the blower engaged, and we're adequately moving air through the system. Mm -hmm. If that stops, that pressure switch opens. Now what this, this error code says is that pressure switch did not close. Okay. Uh, now there's a couple of reasons that could cause that. The number one question that you want to ask yourself, if you go to a water heater, it's presenting in an error code four, you have to ask yourself one question. Is the blower running? Okay, because that question is going to determine where our troubleshooting path is going to go. Right. If the answer to that is no, meaning the blower is not engaging at all, it could only be one of two things. Either the valve is not sending power up to the blower or the, the blower itself just right. won't engage. Uh, now you can check that. Power goes up. It, 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 we're looking for 120 volts on pins two and five uh, at the blower. So right. we can see that power coming up there. 
uh, during that call for heat. If the power is there, you know you have a bad blower. Right. If the power's not there, you know it's the valve. Easy fix, mm -hmm. one of the two things. Now, if the blower is running, right. there's a couple of things to look at. A, again, I, like we mentioned earlier, the, the blower spinning is what creates a vacuum that closes the pressure switch. So, if the blower is spinning, we should be making vacuum. Right. Now, that vacuum gets transferred to the pressure switch via the pressure sensing tube. Mm -hmm. So, the first thing you want to do is visually inspect the top of the heater. Make sure that that pressure sensing tube is intact. Okay. Uh, if it gets unplugged from either end, we can see this type of scenario. So make sure that it's intact on both yeah, sides. Yeah, because it's a normally open switch that closes when it sees that drop in pressure. So it's just sitting there open. If that pressure sensing tube isn't connected to the to the pressure switch, then it's going to sit there open. You're going to get this code. But if it is connected to it, that's when you're going to visually inspect it. Make sure it's not cracked. There's no holes in it. Um, and and we're, we're being able to sense the pressure what the blower is, is giving us. That, that's right. Um, and, and once we do that, we know that the pressure sensing tube is intact we don't have any problems there the next thing you do is just verify the function of, of the pressure switch itself now you may have to create some vacuum on your own mm -hmm. uh, to get that pressure switch to close to open and close we just make sure it's functional the easiest thing to do if you have a digital manometer mm -hmm. on the truck uh, keep some little t-bars um, t-bar hose fittings the easiest thing to do is unplug that pressure sensing tube put your uh, digital manometer in line in right. the pressure sensing tube and fire up the heater. Now we can see exactly how much vacuum uh, that blower is creating. Yes. Then we can go back to our pressure switch. On the pressure switch, it's going to give you a reading of the activation point. Right. It's going to tell you how much negative pressure is needed to close that pressure switch. Now we can look at the blower, mm -hmm. tell how much vacuum is being created, and verify whether that's enough to close yeah, the switch. But you got to have a digital manometer to be able to do that. Yeah, if you're not pulling enough vacuum, uh, it could be the blower, could be another thing, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But if you are pulling enough vacuum, then now you know it's the switch. Yep. If, if you're pulling enough vacuum to activate the switch, but the switch won't activate, replace your switch. Right. Yeah, and you want a digital manometer. Uh, you know, a slack tube manometer will work, but we're dealing with tenths of inches of water yeah. column. Some of our heaters have a negative 0.27 inch water column. That's right. And the only way really we can see that is with a, a digital manometer. So use that digital manometer. Uh, check the, the pressure coming from the blower uh, because it's going to tell you. If you got a blockage, it's going to create a positive positive pressure That's right. if, if you if you're not moving the air because all yeah. we're looking at with this is are we we're moving air and that scenario could definitely happen especially if we have some restriction in the venting mm -hmm. um, maybe they have a 92 close to the blower they have back-to-back -back 90s right. causing too much restriction or maybe the vent run is just too long uh, maybe the problems at termination you, you got a, a squirrel nesting in the termination exactly. I, don't, I don't know things happen <laughs> um, one of the easiest ways to determine this is, is to walk up to the heater, remove the venting. Just take the two inch uh, out of the fern co mm -hmm. and fire the unit. Now remember, do not let the unit run in this environment. All we're trying to do is to see if we can get it to, to run to through the sequence, yeah. right? If we can finish the sequence of operation. So remove the venting, fire the heater up at normal. If that main burner lights, you know you have a problem in the venting somewhere. Uh, and you can start from the heater and work your way out to termination and find the restriction. If it still won't run, then you know the problems with the heater and you can go back and look at some of these troubleshooting yeah. techniques that we just talked about. Yeah, that, that's the easiest way to do it. So first thing you want to know is if the blower is running on an air code 4. If, you're not, if it's not running, check the power coming to the, to the blower um, and, and follow those steps. If you got power going to the blower and the blower won't start, replace the blower. If you don't have power, then you're probably looking at the valve. And then you're going to check the pressure that the blower is actually, if it is starting, Check the pressure, make sure that the switch, you know, your hose is connected to the switch. Uh, check the pressure that the switch is seeing. If, if you're not moving enough air, then we're going to, maybe it's a restriction, maybe not. Uh, you'll have to check for that. But if you, are, if you are seeing the pressure you're supposed to and the switch isn't closing, then it's the switch. And then you can take the, you know, if you're still having problems, take the, the, the venting off. And, and see if we can fire it. Well, that's going to tell us if we're having yeah, a, a that, restriction. Yeah, that cuts the system in yeah, half. Sure we know does. which side we're on, so we're, we can get there faster. Yeah. Let's talk about an error code 6. That's the next one. Yeah, the next one we're going to talk about is an error code 6. Uh, and the way that we know an error code 6, what we're going to see uh, is we're going to see, the again, the green vacation light and the yellow A and B light lit. Okay? Now, what this is is a failed try for ignition. Mm -hmm. uh, it means that the... The, the flame sense rod is not seeing the burner flame. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, typically, this is going to happen on startup. It could happen during the cycle. The water heater will shut off and try to restart that cycle. It'll do it three times. On the third trial for ignition, if it doesn't sense flame, it's going to lock out on this air code six. Okay. Uh, now, the number one cause of this, I would say probably 90% of the time, is clean your flame sense rod. But here's the key. On an error code 6, again, we have one question to ask ourselves. It's presenting in an error code 6. Is the main burner lighting? Right. Okay. Uh, if the answer is no, your problem is on the gas side. Again, something's impeding the gas. Yep. Uh, either a shutoff valve or it needs to be purged or something like that. If the main burner is lighting, clean your flame sense rod. 90% yep. of the time, yep. that will solve the problem. If it doesn't. Uh, the 10% that cleaned the flame rod does not. Now you just want to check your igniter, uh, make sure that it's good. Mm -hmm. We're looking for 11.5 to 18.8 .8 on the igniter. Check your flame sense rod, make sure there's no cracks, frays, or anything like that. Should be good to go. Yeah, so just look through the side glass. You're either going to see a flame or you're not going to see a flame. Kind of like with the Honeywell gas, you know, with the Honeywell standard. You're either going to see the pilot or not. Same way. So we're trying to light the water heater. If you don't see a flame, I'm going to go be looking at my gas. If I do see one, I'm, it's something electrical. That means I'm not seeing the flame right. getting back to the, to the right. control. So uh, it's kind of two ways there, uh, two, two different streets you can run down on air code 6. Mm -hmm. The last one we're going to talk about is an air code 16. This is a little bit different. Uh, let's let's kind of talk about it. Yeah, it is a little bit different. Air code 16 deals with the pressure switch just as the air code 4 does, but in a little bit different way. Uh, on an error code 16, what the valve is telling you is that air pressure switch is chattering for whatever reason, meaning it's opening and closing rapidly, very quickly. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a dead band built into the valve, where if it sees it open and stay open for a duration, it's going to go to a 4. Okay. But if it sees it open and close very rapidly, then it's going to throw this 16. Uh, now, that is there as, a, as an LDO blockage, as the as original idea for okay. that. That's hardly ever the reason. Uh, I'll tell you what normally happens with this heater. As we talked about earlier, it is a condensing unit, uh, which means we are going to produce some condensation both in the combustion chamber and potentially in the venting system itself because draft temperatures are so cool. If we start to get some condensate buildup inside the venting system, that can make its way back into the blower. That condensate gets chopped up by the blower as it's spinning, right. and it causes that chatter and that air pressure switch. Okay. The Vertex comes with a condensate management kit that needs to be installed properly. If not, you can run into this type of scenario with the condensate. Uh, if we can go full screen on this image here, we can kind of show you how exactly this condensate management kit hooks up to the top of the water heater. Uh, we can see here, we, we get a condensate T that goes high up on the exhaust pipe, right underneath the 90, and we can see that it has four barbed connectors there uh, for hooking up our condensate lines. Now, you're going to have two condensate lines that come off the Fernco itself, right. front and back, uh, and that's there to kind of drain off any type uh, of condensate that's coming back out of the venting mm -hmm. system. You're also going to have uh, another one that comes out of the bottom of the blower. If we start to build up uh, condensate that, that makes its way into the blower, it will drain off from there. Uh, we also have a, a fourth one that is optional. Right. If you're using the vent attenuation assembly or the VAA, which is basically kind of the muffler for the vertex, uh, just quiets down the, the amount of air. That's, it, it is a honking blower. It moves a ton of air. So you can get some noise as it travels through the pipe, particularly if there's some fittings there. Mm -hmm. This kind of dampens that, changes the resonance of the pipe, and kind of quiets down yeah, well, I think uh, we've got a, a, a shot of that as well. Yeah, if we go to the, the next image, we can see the VAA, uh, the vent attenuation assembly there. If we're using that, you want to make sure that you also use the condensate line that comes from the VAA. Okay. Uh, and that will attach to the fourth optional barb uh, on your on your condensate T and your exit pipe. If you make sure that you install these the the way per the manual, you shouldn't have any problem with uh, with condensate, and you won't see that error code 16. All right. Well, that about uh, covers what we were going to talk about with our, our Honeywell and now the 76,000 BTU Vertex. And now we want to hear from you. This is the the part where we're going to ask. Uh, you can ask us questions. So, so if you have any questions.
Good morning. Uh, do you have any questions about what we, uh, what you just watched? No, I'm. Yeah, Adam, you can go ahead and ask your questions now. Yes, there is a delay. <laughs> okay, the question is, what about if the arrestor, the flame arrestor on a, um, a standard gas water heater gets wet? Yeah. Yeah, on these products, the, the flame arrestor itself is a stainless steel yeah. flame arrestor. Uh, yeah, we'll grab this and let you get a close-up of it. Not going to hurt anything at all. So if you get some condensation in the bottom of the combustion chamber or something like mm -hmm. that, um, not a big deal. The, the, the burner plate is designed to evaporate any condensation. Right. But if you have a unit, especially if it's undersized mm -hmm. or, or something like that, you may get an abundance of condensation, especially on when you first time you fire the heater up. That may work its way down to the bottom of the combustion chamber, uh, but it won't hurt that flame arrest at all. Yeah, if you're undersized, I mean, the water heater can never really catch up. You're constantly dumping the you know cold water into yeah. the bottom of the tank, and the burner's always on, yeah. And it can never really get up to temperature. It's going to be, you know, it's going to kind of rain in that, yeah. that uh, combustion chamber. Yeah, if you're producing that much condensation that, that you may get that flame arrest or wet, wet you need to look at some other things that may be causing that. Probably got some, some venting issues or something like that. But even if you do, uh, no, you won't hurt that flame rust at all. Next question? Or does that answer your question? Okay, the question is, um, you know, what if your basement floods and, and the water heater gets wet that way? Or uh, we'll, we'll take that one first. And then the next question was uh, the older uh, ceramic heaters, that uh, ceramic uh, flame arrestor on the old C3 model. So let's take the first one, which is the basement flooding. Yeah, um, the, the, on the first one, if the water heater has been exposed to any type of flood waters, it has to be replaced. Um, and, and that's really not due to uh, the water heater itself. It's because of the, the possibility of black mold right. setting up inside between the jacket and the inner tank and those type of things. Um, so the, the water heater has to be replaced. Um, it, you should never try to relight, restart, recommission uh, a water heater that's been exposed to flood right. waters. We have no idea what type of contaminants may be in those waters. Exactly. So the only thing that we could recommend, if it's been exposed to flood waters, it needs to be replaced. Right. Uh, the second portion of that, uh, you're referring to the cordite disc, uh, what was known as the C3 design that had a, a ceramic-like flame arrestor in the bottom of it. Um, water itself was not the problem mm -hmm. if it was to get wet. The problem is, is those little tiny holes. Uh, you can imagine if you have little tiny, gritty, sandy, dusty material yeah. and you get that wet, it can kind of form kind of a paste. Uh, the, those old quarter like this were, were fairly thick. Right. So those tiny little holes would clog up, and if they got wet, it would be that much harder to yeah, clean them out. Yeah, and lint, lint as well, you know, could get up yeah. under there, and if it got wet, it was kind of hard to get clean, and you had to constantly clean those. Yeah, I mean. that, that was the deal. It really didn't hurt the flame no. arrestor itself. It, it, it just made cleaning it so much more of a problem because you basically created a I mean, they a did mud. tests where they put it in water. It didn't do anything to it. Yeah, it and then it water. baked on, but... Yeah. Yeah, the water itself wasn't a problem. It was a mixture of, of the lint and dust and, and right. debris that mixed with that water and kind of forms a paste. The, the new flame arresters are so thin. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it's basically a stainless steel plate, about an eighth of an inch. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you really don't have that problem here. You have any more questions?
The question is, what if just the, the if you get the, the base of the water heater, just the pilot assembly gets wet and not the gas valve? Yeah, it, it, due to EPA standards and, and Department of Energy standards mm -hmm. and those type of things, th th this is kind of a national concern. It's not really our deal. Uh, but if any part of that water heater is exposed to flood waters, they say that it needs to be replaced because yes. there's no way to ensure uh, that What's we don't in the have water. some contaminants. Yeah, yeah that's the deal. Um, so even in, in up to the base ring, we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, the insulation inside the water heater between the jack and the tank can wick up any water that mm -hmm. it may come in contact with. Uh, and you really don't know what's there. So th that's why the, the, the national advice mm -hmm. is, is if that water heater is being exposed to flood waters, no matter how deep, yep. that it needs to be replaced. Any other questions? Uh, the question is, you know, what impact does water, treat, uh, water treatment systems have on water heaters and are, do we need to have, uh, does it affect the uh, anode rods and what type of anode rods should we have uh, when we're using water treatment? Yeah, and I assume we're talking about water softeners. Mm -hmm. um, water softeners are really, really hard on a water heater. Uh, what, what happens is, of course it softens the water. If you have really hard water, um, then you're probably going to need a water softener. The only thing you have to keep in mind, it really strips the inside of the water heater uh, by removing the right. lime scale, mm -hmm. um, the, the, what they call the slime coat on the inside of the water heater. That actually protects the tank. Yes. Uh, by removing that, you're, you're just adding a, a, another layer of exposure to the tank. <coughs> also, the, the anode rod is a big deal as well. As we add a salinity factor to water, right, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're using salt pellets and we're increasing the conductivity of the water. Anytime you do that, you're going to get additional anode rod depletion yep. a lot faster than you would otherwise. <coughs> Excuse me. So you may have to change anode rods more frequently uh, if you're on a water soft. You just need to pay more close attention. Yeah, and you can, you can take older water heaters that you pull out and you can kind of figure out, pull out the anode rods out of those heaters you're taking out and replacing and see the depletion rate. Uh, you can kind of look that way to, to figure out when you should change out those anode rods, especially if you have a water softener. Yeah, if you're a water softener, I would. I I would recommend checking your anode rods at least yearly yes. uh, to make sure that you don't have over depletion. Okay, can you can you repeat the first part of that question? I you're, I couldn't really hear you. And, and I know I heard the what's the difference between a six and a ten year warranty, uh, but kind of repeat the first part of that question. Yeah, and the question is, do we make a 10-year water heater, um, you know, and what's the difference between a 6 and a 10-year, and is it just a kit that, do we make a 10-year, or is it just a kit with an anode rod and paperwork? Yeah, we, we do have both, uh, and we will continue to do both. We'll make a, both a 6-year tank and a 10-year tank, and we will still offer the upgrade, mm -hmm. uh, the, where you can convert the 6-year uh, to, to a 10-year. 10 10 what happens is, is you get a, a, an additional anode rod that goes in is what's called an outlet anode. You remove the hot water nipple mm -hmm. and you drop a new anode rod into the hot water nipple. The anode rod will have a new nipple attached to it. Uh, so basically you have two anode rods in the heater at that point. 
uh, you also get a new data plate right. uh, that transforms that heater as well. And then it's recorded in our system that there's been an upgrade mm -hmm. from a 6 to a 10 to extend the warranty. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, we do have both and we will continue to have both. I mean, you might want to ask your distributor if they can stock some 10 years. Yeah. Um, then that way, you know, you can, you can have access to those 10-year warranties. <coughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. Oh, there's one more. One more question. Okay, the uh, question is, when did we switch from the ceramic flame arrestor to the metal flame arrestor, and how do we determine uh, which is which? Uh, the, the switch happened in 08, uh, towards the end of 08, when we incorporated what was referred to as the next gen right. design, the next generation of FER compliancy. That happened late in 08. Um, so if you have a heater that's 07 and down, uh, between 03 to 07, typically you're going to be in a C3, what they call yeah. C3 design. Um, 08 and after is going to be a next gen design that incorporates a uh, stainless steel. Yeah, and you can tell that by the serial number. And also, I mean, on the uh, the next gen had the door switch. We started with the door switch. Yeah, that, that's your dead giveaway is mm -hmm. looking at the heater. Uh, if we can get a close-up, uh, Heather, on the front of this, on that door switch right there. If you see that on the front of the heater, then you know you're dealing with a next gen design that has a stainless steel flame arrestor. Right. Uh, the C3, the thermal switch was internal. Uh, it was actually soldered in line on the thermal couple. We right. used a proprietary thermal couple that had a, uh, thermal, a fuse, disc. Yeah, yep. thermal disc, fusible link in the thermal couple. Uh, so if you see that door switch, you know you're working with the next gen. Yeah, and, and on the, the, the older style, it was a automatic reset. It would trip at a certain temperature, uh, open up that thermal, thermal couple uh, uh, circuit and kill the, the pilot, and then you'd have to wait till it, it, it cooled down, uh, and then it would reset right. itself, that's and right. then you relight the water heater. Uh, so that, that's the difference is that door switch. Okay, the question is, hey, how important is it to have the water heater level and the whole base on the ground, whole bottom covered, um, you know, where it's large enough to cover the whole base of the water heater? And, and then um, do we offer some type of kit uh, to raise the water heater? And, yeah. yeah, as far as an operation standpoint, uh, the water heater being level or something like that doesn't really change a lot. Now, of course, to, to make the thing structurally safe, right. so you're not going to have a problem, I would definitely make it recommend that the, whatever it's setting on be sturdy and to cover at least the entire mm -hmm. base with a little bit extra. Now, we do sell uh, what's called a water heater stand that is specifically designed for gas water heaters. Um, and most local codes recommend that the water heater be on a stand, right. which raises it up off the floor. If we can get a shot yeah, to our heaters a, in the we've studio, we've got a couple heaters over we here. There we go. Th there's a water heater stand there. Um, now we've painted those black uh, so that they kind of blend in on the set here. Normally these are, are silver in color, um, uh, but that's that's what we're talking about. And you can ask your local distributor about those. Uh, just ask them if they carry a water heater mm -hmm. stand, and if they don't, they can definitely order them for you. All right. Well, we really appreciate you tuning in today. Good job, Jason. 
Guys, have a safe day out there. Appreciate you guys being with us. Yeah, for Jason Leonard, I'm Jerry Winslet. We'll see you next time.